Amen. All right, let's open our Bibles this morning to 2 Samuel chapter 22. We're studying the life of David and we find ourselves in 2 Samuel chapter 22. Yes, we can get through all 51 verses. We did first service, unless first service is still going on in the fellowship hall and I just don't know about it. The topic that we're going to find there, David looked back and he wrote a song portraying his life as if it were a musical. The title of our message this morning, I write the songs that make the whole church sing. (laughs) Songs of love. No, anyway, let's pray. Now I know all of you listen to Barry Manilow. How can you not? I mean, he's a star. Anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our time this morning. We want it to be valuably spent, spiritually spent, having your Holy Spirit teach us from Scripture, Lord, more about you. I pray, Lord, that when we leave this place this morning, we would know something more about your love for us than when we came in and that we would be more in love with you than when we came in. Your love never changes, Lord, but ours can be fickle. It's true that we can keep falling in love with you over and over again. And so I pray that we would today be strengthened in that love, return to that love, whatever relationship we have with your love, Lord, that it would be empowered and strengthened, we pray in Jesus' name. And those who agreed said, Amen. In just a few days, Captain America is going to be portrayed on the big screen. You've got to love his shield. It's made from... I'm told, vibranium, (laughs) fused with an experimental iron alloy and an unknown catalyst. It's virtually indestructible. The vibranium in the shield grants it unusual properties, allowing it to absorb virtually all the kinetic impact from any blows that the shield receives without injuring Captain America in the process. Vibranium is also a factor in the way Captain America throws his mighty shield. He often uses it to ricochet around a room and strike various opponents with little loss of velocity in its forward movement after each impact. The shield was improved by industrialist Tony Stark by incorporating electronic and magnetic components in it so that Captain America can even control it in flight. That's all fictional. Maybe. What is not fictional is the shield David describes in song in 2 Samuel chapter 22. Three times he praises it. The third time saying to God, you have also given me the shield of your salvation. This should excite you if you are a believer because you too are described as having a shield. It's a spiritual shield. It's the shield of faith you read about in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Since we are fellow shield bearers along with David, we can learn something about being behind God's shield from David's song. I'll organize my thoughts around two points. Number one, you are safe behind his shield as God does his work on you. Number two, you are strong behind his shield as God does his work through you. Let's take a look first of all in verses 1 through 28. You are safe behind his shield as God does his work on you. Have you ever thought of your life as a musical? I I remember (laughs) my poor dad. You know, the only TV we could watch when I was growing up, of course, there were only three stations, you know, when I was growing up and no remote. But the only thing we could watch was what he would call shoot 'em up westerns. Uh, Gunsmoke, Cimarron Strip, you know, all those kinds of things. And so when... Uh, he heard that uh, Lee Marvin, tough guy, was in a Western called Painter Wagon with Clint Eastwood. He wanted to see that. Little did he know that it was a musical. I I thought he was going to kill somebody when he found that out. Your life is a musical. In the New Testament, we're told, and I quote, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It's Ephesians 5.19. Now, whether we actually do that or not, which we don't, the idea is that we could, and there's a sense in which our life is so overflowing and effervescent with the joy of the Lord that we sense it as a musical. Now, this chapter, it's a song, or I'm calling it a musical, that David wrote to summarize his life. And so in verse 1... 
Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. You'll find this again essentially the same as Psalm 18. And so 2 Samuel 22, Psalm 18, very much the same. David lets us know it was written towards the end of his reign because he looked back over what God had delivered him from, the hand of all his enemies and the hand of Saul. Now, since this chapter is a song, it's going to be somewhat allegorical in its descriptions of things, especially when we get to God coming on the scene and delivering David from his enemies. It's going to be poetic. David takes license with a kind of reality to paint a picture. It's going to make fantastic comparisons. To do it justice, comments about it ought to therefore be more devotional than doctrinal, although they, like the song, will be based on sound Bible doctrine. In this case, we're talking about the doctrine of sanctification, which has been defined as the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing the whole nature more and more under the influences of the new gracious principles implanted in the soul in regeneration. That's a long way of saying that sanctification is the process through which God changes you daily from glory to glory throughout your life so that you become more like Jesus Christ. The illustration we get in the New Testament, you look into the Word of God, you see, it, Paul says, it's kind of like a mirror where you see dimly, but you do see. You see the image of Christ, and then through the Word and by the Spirit and in your life, you keep seeing Jesus more and more clearly until you are conformed into His image. That's the process of sanctification. It begins at salvation and it ends at your glorification when you die or are raptured. Now, through this song, David is illustrating for us what it would be like if you could see yourself being behind God's shield of faith while he's working on you and through you throughout your life. And the first thing to note, really, in this first set of verses is that God's work on us makes a shield necessary. But behind it, you're kept safe even though it doesn't always seem or feel that way. And so verse 2, and he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be... Remember that song? Say it from my enemies. I remember you remember that song. Barry Manilow wrote that song. No, that's not true. The fact you need a shield in the first place puts you on notice. There is real spiritual warfare going on around you. Same thing when you read these references to the horn and to stronghold. Those are things you need when violence is against you from enemies. You are safe behind the shield of salvation, but it doesn't mean you are held out of danger. And so verse 5, when the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid, the sorrows of Sheol surrounded me, the snares of death confronted me. Think about the weight of those words for a moment. These are heavy experiences that the Lord allowed in David's life. The next time someone tries to cliche his or her way through your suffering, hit them with the fact that David used these extreme words to describe his life. He knew he was safe, but the experience of danger was real nonetheless. You're going to suffer as a Christian. And a lot of times people, well-meaning Christians, they want to help alleviate that suffering, but so often it's just a quick kind of, hey, you shouldn't really be suffering because after all you're a Christian and all things work together for good, so what's the big deal? Okay, Here's the big deal. You're going to go through your suffering and at the end of it, you're going to know what you know. And that is that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and that are called according to his purposes. But while you're in it, it feels like the flood. It feels like death. It feels like all these things that David is talking about. And that's why I think uh, the honest Bible writer said you need to rejoice with those who rejoice and do what? Weep with those who weep. And I think sometimes we jump from 
you know, uh, we just we don't like the weeping because we, we don't want to, you know, come across as if we don't have the answers. And so we go immediately to where somebody's going to end up with. And then you if you're suffering, you feel twice as bad because you already know that you should be going through this in a better way than you are. And then for somebody to tell you that you are doesn't help you. Why don't they just cry with you? Because it hurts. The, the pain, the suffering, the sorrow that you're going through, it really hurts. Hurts. It's like death. It's like a flood. You're going down for the third time. And you need somebody to swim with you, not to just throw out uh, useless platitudes at the time. And so, you know, David is real about his life. He looks back and he says, man, there were times that I was being just absolutely overwhelmed. But through it all, I learned that I was safe behind the shield of his salvation. And so the Lord doesn't keep you from the warfare. He takes you through it to work on you. His work may seem extreme at times because guess what? It is extreme at times. Verse 7, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. I cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry entered his ears. God to the rescue, but not until after you could call the trial a distress and not until after the call became a cry. You are safe, spiritually safe, but you will be buffeted. You will be afflicted. You will suffer. Verse 8, the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub. He flew. And he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning bolts, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. Wow. In every circumstance, whether it was facing Goliath or Saul or Absalom or the Philistines, this is how David saw God as he delivered him from his trouble. It was as if these things actually happened. That's how powerful God's deliverance was when it came. Safe behind the shield of salvation, though buffeted, God came through and took David through it all. And so David says, man, I was dying. I was, you know, I was overwhelmed. And then all of a sudden, it's as if God came riding on a cherub with darkness as his covering and shooting lightning bolts at my enemies. Now, he didn't do any of those things, but that's how powerful God's deliverance was to David. It was just that moment when... Everything turned, you know, and in all the great literature and movies, there's that there's that hopeless moment. And then all of a sudden everything turns because, you know, the the hero comes or something happens. One of my favorite parts of the books, the Lord of the Rings, you know, the city of Gondor is just being devastated and destroyed and all the heroes are about to be killed. And then all of a sudden you hear this horn and all Tolkien has to say is Rohan had come. And you're like, yeah, wow. Get it on, you know, and and that's what David's saying. He says, man, when I was in those situations, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God revealed himself in the most powerful ways that you can imagine. But not until I was going down for the count. Verse 17, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. What an honest guy, David. David says, my enemies were too strong for me. If the Lord hadn't intervened, I would have been destroyed. In a way, that's like saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But In fact, it is saying that, but we have to be careful. Sometimes I think we have the idea that my strength plus the Lord's strength, we're an undefeatable team. And David says, I'm a weakling. My strength is too little. If God hadn't come and revealed himself in my situation, I'd be dead right now. And and that's the attitude God wants us to have. not, Not in our strength, in our weakness, then he is made strong. God didn't keep David from many waters. He plucked him out from them, seemingly at the last minute. He was in a day of calamity, overwhelmed by strong enemies. But the Lord always supported him and then delivered him. Your shield will not shatter but it will be battered through life. 
Now, the next verses, 20 through 25, are perhaps the greatest challenge for us to comment on in this song because often people immediately object to David singing them. Listen to them and maybe you'll understand where they're coming from. Verse 20, he also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not departed wickedly from my God for all his judgments were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless before him. I kept myself from all my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyes. Oh, man. Some of the commentators insist David wrote this song before he sinned, committing adultery and murder. After all, they reason, how could he say such things after he sinned? Would it not be the height of arrogance? Well, actually, they're missing the point. You can never say these things in one sense if they're about you only, because every day you sin in some way, don't you? I mean, we look at David and we think, oh, David had these two big sins in his life. He committed adultery and he committed murder. If it hadn't been for those, he could say this. Well, no, he, no one can say this. Except that God imputes his righteousness to you. Except that God sees you this way as a saved individual. And so David, looking back on his life, he says, my life is the story of God's righteousness being imputed to me, of walking in that righteousness, of being enabled to keep his commandments. Did I do it perfectly? No, because no one can. No one can. No one ever has except for Jesus Christ. And so it's not that we criticize David for saying this or that he could have said this before those big sins. No, he could have never said this, really, from a human point of view. But it just shows us what God has done on our behalf. There are no works of righteousness that we can do that can endear us to God. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of our own righteousness is like filthy rags. But God nonetheless looks at us, and if we're believers in Jesus Christ... If we've believed in Him, He sees us in Christ and it's just as if we'd never sinned. And this is true of us. And so today, after we get done with all of our sinning, minor and major, and I only say that because the Bible says if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. And so now you've sinned twice. You've sinned and you've lied about it. Tomorrow when you get up, this can be your declaration. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. The Lord has given me His righteousness and this is the life that I hope to live. Every day, more and more as I await his return. When you sin, if you'll confess it, repent from it, God will bring you out into this broad place, restoring you because he delights in you and he sets you back on the path of righteousness. And then all of these things become true of you. Verse 26, with the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the pure, you show yourself pure. And with the devious... You show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. Now, these last verses of this section, at least, contrast God's dealings with believers versus non-believers. If you're among the humble believers, you're being worked on every day to see God more clearly, his nature, his attributes, his character, some of which is spoken of here. If you're among the haughty, we would say a non-believer, God's working on you, too. Now, a lot of people object to God's work being called shrewd, but I think it has the sense, uh, almost a positive connotation here of how intelligent and wonderful the work of God is with the non-believer. If you understand the problem in the Garden of Eden, the distance that Adam put between mankind and God, and how that distance could never be bridged by anything man could ever hope to think or do, and then you realize what God did in saying, I'm going to come as a man and as the God man, satisfy all of the requirements of holiness and also be your substitute. That's a shrewd plan because it's the only plan. And so what these verses are saying is that God is striving with non-believers, offering them this opportunity, hoping that he doesn't have to bring them down ultimately to the grave. 
without salvation. And so God is working on you. He has promised in the New Testament to complete the work he's begun. He changes you daily, moment to moment, to become more like Jesus. We'd like it better, at least I would, if he did it solely through instruction as I read and study his word. But those of you, you remember when you went to school and you had labs. You went and you studied and then you had labs. I remember one lab I had in comparative psychology, which is a joke. But anyway, sorry, um, if there's any comparative psychologists out there, God loves you. But uh, comparative psychology, I remember I had a lab where I had to dissect a sheep's brain and find different areas of the brain. Have you ever seen a sheep's brain in a petri dish? It's like it all looks it looks like one sponge. I can't I couldn't find anything. I couldn't I kept cutting it and cutting it until there was nothing left to it. I flunked my lab. It was crazy. God has laboratories for you and we call it life. And so every day in all the situations and circumstances, that's the lab in which the indwelling Holy Spirit takes the word of God and says, "Now let's make an application." of what we've been reading about and what we've been studying about. Here's your opportunity to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit and to walk like Jesus Christ. And as that happens and as that unfolds, we have a sense that we are safe behind the shield of salvation. Now, the remaining verses, you are strong behind that shield as well. Because a shield is not just for defending. It affords us the ability to move forward, to gain ground, even as the battle is raging. Verse 29, for you are my lamp, O Lord, the Lord shall enlighten my darkness, for by you I can run against a troop, by my God I can leap over a wall. This speaks of pursuit at night, over and through many obstacles. If you find yourself in a dark place with hindrances in your path, from behind your shield, you're going to find out that you have night vision, you have spiritual night vision and spiritual strength to make progress. Verse 31, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He's a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? God is my strength and power. He makes my way perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. Was he not a shield to all those who have come before us, whose stories we have recorded for us? Can you not say God was a rock, strength, and power to each of them? Did He not work on them and through them to make their way perfect? Think of any of them. Job, Abraham, Moses, Joshua. Read Hebrews 11, the famous hall of faith. God is doing the same work on and through you. It may not seem as profound in its effect on the world. You're not written about in the Bible but it's the same work that he was doing on those men and women that he's doing on and through you. Verse 34, he makes my feet like the feet of deer and sets me on my high places. Or as the King James says so beautifully, he makes my hind's feet on high places. Speaking of a particular kind of deer. You may think your footing is treacherous, but in the Lord, your balance is always strong. Verse 35, he teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. In the original Karate Kid, Daniel LaRusso tells his mom he needs to learn real karate. Remember that scene? Because he's getting beat up by people who know real karate. He says, I can't go to the Y and take 10 minute lessons. I need to know real karate. Just so as a Christian, you need to be learning real Christianity. And that involves actual warfare. You need to be strengthened to be able to bend a bow of bronze. Through it, you're strengthened. It's, uh, suffering in some form or another is not the exception for the believer. It's the norm. Commenting on trends in the modern church, one author wrote, I kind of like this, he says, at some point during the last quarter century, it became all too common to stop proclaiming a gospel directed at people's real spiritual needs and instead focus on the wants and desires of potential churchgoers. More than mirroring the first century church, this conduct reflects the way Starbucks markets overpriced coffee to potential customers. I didn't just include it because of that last line. Every now and then you catch me at Starbucks, don't you? You say, oh my gosh, Pastor Gene is at Starbucks. What's the matter? <laughs> hey, even bad coffee is good. <laughs> anyway, anybody from Starbucks here this morning? We love you. God bless you, sister. Yeah. Anyway.
anyway, uh, here's the deal. And you know this is true. Churches, over the last quarter century, they began to focus on potential church goers, how to get people to come into the church. And one of the ways you get people to come into the church, you don't tell them anything too heavy about their life. You know, what I'm talking about today would not happen, not, not because, I mean, there's a lot of churches doing what we're doing, but there's a lot of churches that say, hey, that's too heavy. The first time a person comes to church, don't be telling them that their life could turn out like Job. What if their life turns out like Job? Well, I don't know, maybe we'll catch them before that happens, who knows? And so the church has gotten into trying to reach people with a watered-down gospel, and the effect of it is that even Christians... Uh, are you know it's it, they don't like this message about suffering and the theology of suffering and the fact that hard times might come in their life and uh, it's just not the gospel. Suffering is the rule, not the exception. I'm going to treat everybody at Starbucks after church, but anyway, uh, you've also given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. David, looking back over his life, he could see his mistreatment by his family. His sheep being attacked by lions and bears, the defiance of Goliath while Israel trembled, his more than a decade of persecution from Saul, living in caves as a fugitive, falling into sin, the rebellion of his own son Absalom. And then he looks at all that and he says, God, you were gentle when you dealt with me in all of those situations. Thank you for your gentleness. Remember when David sinned with Bathsheba and God said, here's what's going to happen. The sword is never going to depart from your house. And the son that is born of this union, I'm taking him to heaven right now. David looked at that and he says, oh God, how gentle you are. How wonderful your gentleness. All the things, Lord, that you could have done and maybe should have done and that I deserved. You were gentle with me. How often in my own heart do I think what God is doing is so harsh, so hard. And yet David, at the end of his life, I, hopefully at the end of my life, I'll look back and say, oh Lord, you were so gentle in bringing me to this understanding. Verse 37, you enlarged my path under me so my feet did not slip. This verse reminds me of those cartoons where the hero gets con- cornered. There's no way out and then he draws a circle and goes through a tunnel. And then as the coyote is standing there, the train comes through and flattens him. Uh, that's kind of, you know, David says, I was just, I was cornered. And then all of a sudden there was a circle. Drew. It's like God drew a circle and I, I escaped and my enemy was overwhelmed. Do you wish you could flatten people sometimes like that and just shake them out and they'd be okay? Maybe you don't think in cartoon terms, but I do. <laughs> Something beautiful about the cartoon world. Verses 38 through 46 extol the extent of David's victories. He says, I have pursued my enemies. And destroyed them. Neither did I turn back again until they were destroyed. I've destroyed them and wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. You have armed me with strength for the battle. You've subdued under me those who rose against me. You've also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. They looked, but there was none to save, even through the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I trod them like dirt in the streets. I spread them out. You have also delivered me from the strivings of my people. You have kept me as the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. The foreigners submit to me. As soon as they hear, they obey me. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from hideouts. Now, you may not feel this way now in the midst of your life and its troubles and the troubles that are to come. Still, in one sense... Your most vicious enemies have already been vanquished for you. Sin was vanquished on the cross of Jesus Christ as the Lord paid its penalty and bore its punishment for you. One day you'll be free from its very presence. But for now you can walk in victory over sin. Death was vanquished on the cross of Jesus Christ as the Lord died for the sins of the world, then rose from the dead to offer life to whosoever will believe in Him. And so, I mean, to me, whatever I might be going through... It has, you know, it's not as bad as death and sin. It's not as great an enemy. It's not a greatest dilemma to resolve. And so if God has solved that, then he can get me through the other. Verse 47, the Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. And, well, anyway, 
I love these songs that are in the songs. The God of my salvation. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. David enjoyed moments of victory. And looking back, those moments were all that he could see. He didn't minimize the warfare or the danger, but through it all he understood God was not just working on him, but through him, strengthening him, maturing him. Verse 50, Therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles. Sing praises to your name. He is the tower of salvation to his king. Chose mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. God shows mercy always. Sometimes, however, it is what C.S. Lewis called severe mercy. God's work of salvation is the expression of a love so severe, so intense, that it would allow me to lose everything, yet so merciful that I am able to gain Christ in return. Severe mercies always dot the landscape of God's dealings with His saints. I earlier mentioned Job, Abraham, Moses, and Joshua all those in Hebrews 11. At one point or another, in some way or another, they each experienced the love of God so severely as to lose everything, yet His mercy in gaining Christ in return. Job put it best when he said, Though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. Job did lose everything except his life. He even lost part of his health. And Job said, Though He kills me, I will trust Him. He understood the intensity of the love of God, that just him and God were better than anything else. Abraham would learn this lesson. Later in his life, God would come to him and say, Abraham, we're doing great. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your only son, in whom are all the promises that I made you, and you're going to take him up to Mount Moriah. You're going to sacrifice him unto me. You're going to kill him. Abraham got right up, headed out. And the New Testament tells us that he so believed God that God would have had to raise Isaac from the dead. But the point is, that which was most precious to Abraham in all, not not just as a son, but all the promises of God were represented in Isaac. God said, I, I'm going to I'm going to ask you to give that up, literally to kill that for my love. And Abraham said, I, I know you well enough now that, that I want that love. And, and if you're asking me to do it, I'll do it. On a smaller scale, or one maybe we can understand better, the rich young ruler. He's a great kid. You ever think of what a great kid he was? If you're a parent, you want your daughter to marry the rich young ruler. He's following God. He's you know, keeping the commandments, he says. He's, plus, he's got a lot of money. I mean, he's doing well, and and in their culture at that time, that was a good thing. They thought that God was blessing you, and so he comes to Jesus, they have this encounter. He says, I want to follow you, what do I need to do? I'm doing all these things. Jesus said, here, I'm looking at your heart with the help of God the Father and the word of knowledge. There's one thing that you need to do. You need to liquidate all your assets, get rid of all your wealth, and then follow me. And you will know in complete and in full the love of God. And that young man went away sorrowful because he had much, but he didn't have the Lord in the fullest sense. And you know, a lot of times we spend, we waste a lot of time talking about that story about trying to establish, oh, God's not going to ask you to give up everything. That's not the point of the story. And it's not. That was what that young man needed to give up, his wealth. God doesn't ask all of us to live in poverty in order to follow him. But you know what? Throughout our lives... Many different times, I believe, God does come to us and He says, Gene, there's something I want you to give up for me, to gain insight into my love for you. It's not always an idol. It's not always something terrible. It's not always something sinful. But God will continue to come to us because His love is an intense, jealous love. And He wants to bring us to the point where we would be able to say, though He slays me, Yet will I trust him. What kind of a crazy person says that? A person who's crazy in love with Jesus Christ. Knowing that the love of God is pure and rich and better than anything this world has to offer. All of us are the rich young ruler many different times in our lives. 
God's love for you is not an indulgent, pampering love that leaves you to yourself. It's a jealous love that removes everything else that competes for His affection in your heart. It's a love that refines you and changes you rather than leaving you as you are. Each episode, every circumstance in your life has been designed to strip away what is temporal to replace it with something which is eternal. When it seems you are being buffeted, when trials are all around you, when the suffering seems too much to bear, then you should picture yourself behind the shield of God's salvation, remembering that His work is really gentle in the long run and it's bringing you to a desired end. You're not there yet and that's why the buffeting is going on. But He's already given you the greatest victories. You're saved for eternity. You can overcome sin. You have nothing to fear from death. In fact, you probably will get to the point where you welcome it to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. The rest of the picture, what we call living, is just filling your heart with the wonder of your love. And so your life, it really is God's musical. Listen to your heart for a moment. Here's your homework, as it were. Listen to your heart. What songs are you singing? If you could amplify your heart, And and if there were songs in your heart, what songs are you singing? Let's pray.